silent of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are known, from all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. <coughs> St. Lawrence, Deacon and Martyr, pray, pray for us. St. Eusebius, Priest and Confessor, pray for us. St. Catherine of Stenning, pray for us. St. Wilfred of York, pray for us. St. Richard of Chichester, pray for us. St. Louisa of Alfriston, pray for us. Our Lady of Walsingham, pray for us. Our Lady Seat of Wisdom, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Right, well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to this uh, fifth or sixth conference, sixth I think, uh, on tradition. Now last week we uh, discussed the maxim uh, lex orandi, lex credendi, lex vivendi. The law of prayer denotes what we believe, dictates how we live. And we reflected uh, last week on the liturgy, the purpose of the liturgy, uh, what the liturgy does, and what the rites and rituals and sacraments of the church do to enable us to know, love, serve, and be happy with God in this life and in preparation for the next. Now, today, of course, is the eve of the great feast of the Dormition of the Mother of God. And uh, this feast speaks to us of the future. In, in essentially, the Feast of the Dormition speaks to us of the life to come. It is not something, generally speaking, that uh, many uh, people reflect upon these days. Uh, that is to say, they don't reflect on it very seriously. Um, and in part, that's because there is a lot about uh, the, the next life that we don't know. Uh, we don't have all the details about it. There has been, of course, uh, much speculation uh, over the centuries about it, but there are some things that we do know about it, that we know from Scripture, uh, and that we know from the tradition of the Church. And because the aim of the Christian life is to enjoy that eternal life, uh, it's probably worth us spending a few moments um, thinking about it. We begin uh, the pre-season of Jessima, uh, sorry, the pre-season of Lent, Jessima, uh, every year, uh, hearing that, those wonderful words of St. Paul, uh, likening the Christian to an athlete, and saying that we should be like athletes uh, who put all their energy and, and enthusiasm uh, into training so that they can win first prize. And we as Christians, he says likewise, ought to be um, putting all our energy and enthusiasm into the sanctification of our lives with the goal and purpose of heaven. Now, as we reflected last week, when we say heaven, or when we, uh, heaven essentially, of course, means the kingdom of God. Um, and what we ought not to think is of the over-romanticised, sentimentalised images uh, of heaven that have come to us through the ages. We are not going to be uh, transformed into angels. We are not going to have uh, wings, we don't think, or halos. Uh, we're not going to sit on clouds with our feet dangling over the edge, strumming harps. Instead, what scripture speaks of and suggests is something much more exciting, much more exciting. A new heaven and a new earth. Uh, the reconciliation and the restoration of God with his creation. Whereas at this moment, uh, the life as we experience it, we might say uh, there is an epistemic distance between ourselves and God, meaning that God doesn't seem always to be obvious to us uh, in the next life we're going to be like that with God there'll be no getting away from him he'll be there 
all the time. Now, of course, in reality, he is with us all the time. It's we who can't see him. It's we that in so many ways prevent ourselves uh, from seeing him. Um, and as we said last week, it's, it's uh, sin uh, that prevents us uh, from seeing him or from, or from us being able uh, to be aware and to realise and to receive his love and his grace and his mercy. We've spoken before about seeing with the eyes of faith, uh, being able to interpret and understand the world around us, uh, not necessarily as it first seems, but always to understand it in the light of divine revelation, to understand it in the light of God's plan, which has been revealed to us. You will often hear so many people uh, talk rubbish about, you know, or, who, who, you know um, uh, we don't know uh, what God's plan is uh, for us, for the world, etc., etc. Of course we do. That's the whole point of the gospel. The plan has been revealed in Jesus Christ. The plan is the same as it was ever in the beginning. The plan is, has always been for us to live in love and in union with God. That has always been the plan. That has always been God's plan. And there is a little joke, isn't there, um, about plans. And if, uh, if, we, if we, think we, we think we have plans and God laughs or something like that. Um, but as, uh, as we've reflected in our uh, discerning God's will uh, on Saturday mornings um, the future uh, is all sorts of possibilities but the ultimate future is to be realised uh, in uh, and with God in heaven. Now the feast of the, of the Dormition, the falling asleep of the Blessed Virgin Mary and her assumption, her bodily assumption into heaven we say of that in the church that our Lady thereby receives uh, the first fruits. She herself, as it were, is the first to receive what the promise of salvation in Christ is about. So that uh, she is the first to uh, experience, as it were, the resurrection of the body. She is the first to experience the transformation of this, uh, from this corruptible into an incorruptible uh, existence. Remembering, of course, that though Our Lady's uh, body was indeed, um, we might say more than consecrated, super consecrated, you couldn't get more touched by God than, than Our Lady's womb. Uh, but even so, of course, uh, she was uh, flesh and blood uh, in the same way that we are flesh and blood. So that her reception uh, into heaven uh, necessitated, uh, obviously, um, some transformation, or we might say some transfiguration. And likewise, too, we might hope um, for something similar to ourselves. We, in the Creed, uh, declare our belief in uh, the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. And as we've said before, uh, perhaps the resurrection of the body is like unto the transfigured body of Christ, or indeed, uh, with the attributes uh, of uh, his post-resurrection appearances. But anyway, Scripture certainly suggests to us that rather than sitting on clouds, uh, we will be, as it were, in a better universe, a better world. And we might be able to sort of glimpse this if we can imagine, um, we might think of Louis Armstrong's famous song, What a Wonderful World, um, Imagine a world uh, where there is uh, no pain and no suffering, where there is no death, uh, there are no more tears, and, uh, and, uh, and creation uh, as God had originally intended it. Uh, if we think that uh, much in nature is beautiful now, uh, imagine what the new earth uh, is going to look like. It's going to be um, incredible, absolutely amazing. And we're going to have eternity to enjoy it to walk through it. Now, of course, and that's the thing, isn't it? That uh, in Genesis, uh, we hear, we read of God walking with Adam in the garden. And ultimately, that is the destination for us. Ultimately, that is what the reality of heaven will be for us and what eternal life will be for us. 
will be able to enjoy uh, the restoration and uh, uh, of creation with God as, as it had originally been intended. And we, like Adam, will be walking in that new earth, uh, enjoying that new heaven uh, with God as our companion. Now with all that, which is um, of course um, uh, hugely aspirational from our perspective right now, uh, how do we uh, live in the present moment? How do we live now uh, with the hope and with the expectation and with the aim and desire to realise for ourselves uh, the new heaven and the new earth, the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. And here of course tradition uh, throughout the ages has developed and provided all sorts of ways and means by which we can attempt to realise in this life something of the kingdom, something of the kingdom experience, something of, uh, of realising that which is uh, within ourselves. Remember our Lord said the kingdom of God is not here nor there, it's within you. Well, it's not within everyone, it's within those who have been baptised, it is within those who have acknowledged and accepted and recognise that they are children of God, recognise God as their father, recognise Jesus as their friend and their brother. So how do we uh, ex how do we live that? How do we live? How do we try to make present that reality in our lives? Well, of course, our Lord Himself gives us the summary of the law: love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength, and love your neighbour uh, as you love yourself. Now, of course, as we've reflected many times before, uh, that those last few words, "love yourself," uh, does not mean um, in an egotistical way. Uh, does not mean, you know, God, I love myself, so I should be, you know, if only people who really love themselves were really good at loving other people too, that would be incredible, wouldn't it? Um, but, uh, of course, the summary of the law um, Christ gives us to help us to interpret and to understand uh, divine revelation, to understand the divine precepts and the counsels uh, that we glean from Scripture as to the way in which God desires us and wishes us to live our lives. Now, essentially, we might understand that the way in which we ought to live our lives, the attitude and approach that we ought to have and we ought to take, is to strive to live here on earth as citizens of heaven. I think we often forget, as Christians, that we are first and foremost citizens of the kingdom of God. That was the whole point of our baptism. That's what we became through our baptism. As I've said before, we're no longer just ordinary human beings, but we are actually citizens of the kingdom. We've been made and recognised as such uh, by virtue of our regeneration through the waters of baptism in Christ, so that we have literally been uh, changed and transformed. As St Paul puts it, uh, we died to the old self and rose anew, a new creation in Christ, speaking of course to the ultimate realisation of that new creation which will be in the fulfilment of uh, the kingdom, when we will live um, perfectly balanced as God had originally intended, but which there is the key to our existence now, is to strive to live that balance between spiritual and earthly, to try and uh, live that balance between our sense of self and our identity uh, with and in and through Christ and ultimately God. So I think it would help us inordinately as uh, Christians to remember that we aren't supposed to live and experience life here as others do. Our attitude, our approach should be different because we have uh, a different understanding about what life is and what life means. See, we understand and we know through the divine revelation and through our experience of faith and that um, our lives are not our own. Our lives are not our own. We are not put here to experience life for our own amusement. 
We're not put here to experience life for our own benefit. We're not here to experience life to suit and satisfy ourselves. Now there, of course, is the great countercultural radical distinction and difference between the attitude and approach of the Christian to anybody else. Everybody else uh, basically <coughs> is here to suit and serve themselves. Everybody else here, their one aim in life is to satisfy themselves. And they equate their sense of fulfillment uh, by uh, uh, their misunderstanding of, of um, satisfaction and fulfillment in this life, which most people uh, regard as through material possessions. Now, it's, it's fair, fair to say that, of course, not everyone uh, who is not a Christian uh, is simply materialist. That's not necessarily true. Uh, there are a great many people, of course, uh, believers of other faiths, uh, people who uh, are spiritual uh, but not committed to any particular doctrine. Um, and they, of course, understand, uh, they, under, they get this, um, this notion of uh, uh, a difference in approach with regard to material things. But generally speaking, even in most of the other world religions, um, the pursuit and the equipment of um, material possession and wealth uh, is sometimes a signifier, they, they interpret it sometimes as a signifier of blessings. Indeed, uh, even within um, various forms of so-called Christianity, um, there is this notion of a um, prosperity gospel, where there are Christians who literally think that uh, they know they are blessed in this life if they are materially rich, if they are materially wealthy, that even, that even the pursuit of riches uh, in this life is a sign of uh, God's blessing um, and you know needless to say all of that uh, is is wrong all of that is wrong if anything uh, we should determine in this life and we should strive in this life uh, a certain detachment and disdain from material things as far as we uh, are able as far as we as far as it is possible in other words only to regard material things as far as they are necessity so as far as they are necessary for our life, so as far as they are, you know, water is necessary, um, food is necessary, um, clothing is necessary. And indeed, we may think of those questions that we are going to be asked by our Lord uh, on that day of uh, judgment before the new heaven and the new earth, uh, when he will ask, where were you when I was hungry, when I was naked, when I was thirsty, when I was sick, when I was imprisoned, when I was a stranger? And there is a key, uh, in many ways, to the way in which we are to manifest and demonstrably live the summary of the law in our lives. And as I've said many times before in homilies, um, we might strive to seek to serve um, Christ in each other. But we might also recognise in those questions that they are, as it were, um, uh, the fundamentals so thirst, uh, food, clothing, um, in sickness and in health, uh, imprisonment and a stranger. Christ asks, or will ask us, where were we when he was in need of all those things? And so we might understand uh, that how uh, we manifest uh, our love of God uh, to each other uh, is through the fulfilment of striving to provide those things, those necessary things for one another and for anybody else. Indeed, when we look at the uh, description of the early church in the second chapter of Acts, we see how they shared according to need. They shared what they had uh, and gave as people needed it. So if somebody needed a coat and somebody had two, they gave them a coat. Um, and always perhaps it's uh, as well to understand that there is a balance to strike here. Um, 
God, uh, as, as, as my um, parish priest as a child once put it, God gave you a brain, use it. Um, and so with regard to the exercise of charity, prudence is also necessary. Um, so there's, you know, there's not much point, for example, in uh, giving somebody your coat if that means you're going to freeze to death. Um, you should do instead what St Martin did, of course, which was to tear his cloak in half and give one half to the beggar and keep the other half for himself. And remember in that story that the beggar was Christ. And St Martin was, was blessed and his life changed and transformed um, by that encounter, by that experience and by that um, practice of charity or sacrificial loving or sacrificial giving. So likewise with ourselves. Now as uh, we reflected the other day uh, on the feast of uh, St Clair of Assisi, uh, last, I think last Monday, uh, we reflected in the homily then about uh, the spirit of poverty and the attitude that we should have. And we reflected on how for St Francis and of course for St Clair, um, poverty for, men, for them meant the disavowal of of property. In, indeed, St. Clair made the point of asking the Pope uh, to ensure that uh, her sisters would not be required ever to own anything. Now there's, you know, and a, way of, a, a way of understanding or appreciating uh, that which marries with the understanding that we might take for the purpose of humanity itself embodied in Adam in the garden where he was given stewardship of, uh, of the garden, stewardship of creation. We, by extension then, are sharing with Adam in that vocation still as hu of humanities as stewards of God's creation. And as well as, of course, uh, that meaning uh, stewardship of nature, uh, also too, of course, it means stewardship uh, of material things purpose of course is for us to know love serve and be with him and for others to know love serve and be with him so if we try to use and adopt that attitude uh, ourselves in the way we live our lives as exiled citizens of the kingdom here on earth we will uh, realize that as our Lord elsewhere says where your treasure is, there is your heart also. And what's the point of, who wants to suggest that where their heart is, is in their bank account, or is in their nickel drawer, or is, you know, wherever. Who, you know, um, where our heart is, where our hearts are supposed to be, of course, is in heaven. In many ways, uh, we might imagine that um, our heart is indeed in heaven and we are striving with all our might to, to be united with it. That is essentially what our Lord is talking about in those parables where he says the kingdom of heaven is like. Uh, like a trader who finds a rare pearl, sells everything else to buy that pearl. Or somebody um, who finds that treasure in the field, sells everything he has to, to have that treasure. Where your heart is. So Bearing that in mind, how, uh, from tradition, uh, can we find assistance to enable us to realise our lives as exiled citizens of heaven here on earth? As I said last week, essentially in uh, the lives of the saints. Um, obviously uh, in the life uh, of the Blessed Virgin Mary. Um, because... As I said yesterday in my homily, they were ordinary people. They did extraordinary things, but they were ordinary people. They were flesh and blood, just as you and I are flesh and blood. What made them unique and different from the rest of humanity, what made them stand out, uh, was because of what they were able to achieve by virtue of God's grace by being able to cooperate with God's grace, by striving themselves for that perfection necessary and which will only be realised ultimately 
um, in the kingdom uh, of God. Now we spoke uh, last week about the sacraments and how they uh, enable us to know, love and serve God. And uh, they, and in today's homily I referred to uh, how um, we might sanctify uh, our lives, sanctify our days. Um, because holiness ultimately is the point of the Christian life. Uh, on earth we are striving to become holy, striving to become uh, one with he who is all holy. And in order to do that, it needs, we needs, must, strive always to remember uh, God's presence around us, to strive always uh, to uh, remember that the purpose of our life is to become one with God, uh, to strive always to remember to keep things in perspective and remember that this life is nothing compared to the eternal life that we may have uh, if we stay on the straight and narrow path. Um, to remember that for all the benefits and advantages in so many ways that this life seems to be able to afford us uh, in mater in materially, again, we can't take it with us. And in the new heaven and the new earth, we'll, we'll have no need for it. So sanctification of our daily lives now, um, I realise uh, it's empty, so I've, I've got to make some more, but um, holy water. Now, I know some of you um, take uh, Epiphany water home uh, every year, um, and uh, what you ought to do, uh, what you might think to do, um, is just as we have here uh, a holy water stoop, uh, you can find all sorts of variations, some nice, some not so nice, um, that you can stick on a wall uh, by, um, by the door. Um, but just as we do when we come into church, to bless ourselves. The idea being there, of course, uh, is to recall and to remember our baptism, is to recall and to remember our being blessed and set apart. In many ways, it's to remind us that we are a child of God. And blessing ourselves with holy water, just as we, just in the same way as we enter and leave uh, church, reminds us of God, reminds us of our baptism. So too, we can do the same at home. We could come in and out of our front door at home, remembering that we are a child of God, blessing ourselves, blessing our our journey in, uh, our, sorry, our journey out, uh, or blessing our return home, giving thanks uh, for for returning home safely. Holy water um, has always been um, something that, uh, in tradition, the faithful have always rather taken to themselves. Um, you may have seen various videos uh, on Facebook and social media or on YouTube of our Eastern brethren and how excited they get uh, about Epiphany water or, th or Theophany water. Um, they, they bless huge, great vats of the stuff um, uh, every January uh, and they take buckets, literally gallons of it home and throughout the rest of the year they will use it for all sorts of things, all sorts of things and what's important to understand that in no way is, uh, th th there's nothing you can do to as it were desecrate it so uh, some of them uh, will often put some drops of it in their tea or in their coffee some of them will uh, sometimes bathe with it. Um, some of them uh, will often drink it uh, first thing in the morning as, a, as, a, as an awakening drink. Uh, they will use it to sprinkle uh, around their home. They will use it to sprinkle over devotional objects or prayer books or icons or statuary or rosaries. Uh, they will use it to bless each other. They will use it at grace to bless meals, to bless the food. Um, they will cook with it as well as drink with it. Um, they will bless the garden with it. Uh, they will, when they have planted seeds, they will go and sprinkle uh, theophany water over that. Uh, they will use theophany water, uh, holy water, um, in all sorts of ways. And what they are doing is sacralizing the ordinary. 
they're making holy um, the mundane, uh, and they're making holy the material. And all this, of course, is incarnational. This is our faith. Our faith is incarnational. It's all about God blessing and divining uh, the material. Um, our Lord himself, God made man, uh, is, uh, is, you know, is, that is the incarnation. Um, but that's, that, that's the principle uh, are that, that the ordinary and the mundane becomes holy, can become holy, can be used uh, toward holiness. So, uh, so from tradition then, we might uh, take the, this, this tradition of using holy water. Um, now, I might just add that there are sort of uh, variants of uh, holy water. Uh, in the East, generally, uh, it is just water. Uh, in the West, often, in our tradition, it is uh, salt and water. So you have to be careful sometimes um, if you're in intending to ingest it. Um, you might want to check uh, in, you know, how it's been made. Uh, that is to say, um, that, you know, check whether it was just made with a blessing uh, or check to see whether salt was exercised and blessed and mixed with it as well. Um, and of course, you know, that's what is salt and water, but a saline um, and, um, and a long denoter of um, purity uh, and, of, and of health. Um, and in many ways, that's the attitude uh, that Christians who use holy water um, have in using it. Um, so holy water is one way in which um, we can sacralize and bless our daily living. Um, now, I've, I've not started, by the way, with, with prayer, because I've spoken a lot about that um, before, but, but obviously prayer is, is the first and foremost way in, 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 which, one, in, in, way in which one sacralizes uh, one's life and existence. Um, and with prayer, I mean, prayer can be, prayer, prayer can be anytime, anywhere, and about anything. You see, as I said before, what is prayer? Prayer is a spiritual conversation. What did Adam enjoy in the garden? A relationship with God where they walked and talked together. What are we aiming for? What are we going to realise, hopefully, for ourselves in the new heaven and the new earth, is to walk in there with God. And when you're, you know, if you're in a relationship with someone, you talk to them. As I said the other day, um, it's important to... Um, uh, put air into the words you breathe. That itself is, as it were, an incarnational act. It's, it's giving life, as it were, um, uh, to, to your words, to the concepts that the words convey, to the intentions that your words convey. Now, obviously, um, if you're on the train or on the bus or whatever, you might want to sort of sotto voce uh, in terms of, uh, if, you're, if, you're, you know, if, if you're going to pray, uh, in public so that people don't think you're talking to yourself or, or that you're mad. Again, you see where prudence is always necessary, always helps in terms of balance. Um, but generally speaking, when we pray, we ought to pray vocalising. We ought to vocalise it. Um, because that is the difference between uh, being in love with someone and telling someone that you love them. Or uh, being grateful uh, for something uh, and saying, expressing that you're grateful. Um, it's, 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 uh, so it is with, with God, if we're going to realise our relationship with God, then we need to realise our conversation with him. So prayer uh, is an obvious, uh, of course, uh, tool for sacralising uh, our day-to-day -day existence. But, um, Devotional objects. Now it's long been uh, the custom uh, amongst Christians to have devotional objects, to have crosses or crucifixes, uh, to have icons or images or statuary. Um, and the important thing here, of course, uh, is not to fall into the trap of, um, uh, of, of idols. So the important thing to, to remember uh, when we use devotional objects, that they are not ends in themselves. 
um, they are um, aid de memoir, uh, really. They are uh, a tool, a way of, of um, uh, representing to us um, spiritual beings or spiritual concepts. But they are not uh, of them an end in and of themselves. Um, so that even when, for example, the proper attitude uh, within the church regarding um, icons that, that uh, exude myrrh or um, statues of the Blessed Virgin that cry tears or whatever, um, we should never get too caught up with, as it were, the material aspect uh, of that uh, sort of phenomena, but rather we should focus on the spiritual, what is this spiritually signified. Um, so, um, but at the same time, of course, we ought to treat, uh, especially things that have been blessed, we should not treat them as we might treat anything else. Um, so that blessed icons, blessed crucifixes, blessed crosses, blessed rosaries, etc. These um, should be treated and handled with care and with respect. Uh, as I've stated before, um, often I'm given that if somebody dies um, and, and people uh, will bring uh, their rosaries uh, of the deceased or, or statues or whatever um, for proper, as it were, disposal. And ultimately, if these things are to be disposed of, they're disposed of by fire. Um, that is the usual way to dispose of something that has been hallowed. Um, but um, I prefer, as, as far as I can, to, to pass them on, if I'm able. Um, I think there's something rather lovely about passing on to another Christian uh, a cross or a crucifix or, or aid to devotion that, that a previous Christian has, has used and held on to and, and said their prayers with, etc. So... Um, devotional objects are another way in which, from tradition, uh, we can sacralize our lives. And again, here, this is why um, um, you will find that people place icons and, and crucifixes and crosses, etc., uh, on the walls of their homes. Um, a traditional place for um, a crucifix um, is uh, uh, above one's bed. Um, uh, in one's uh, entrance hall so that uh, it's something that catches your eye uh, as you walk in. Um, but there is, no, there is, no, is it no limit, as it were, aside from taste um, and practical consideration uh, as to how and many and where you might place uh, such things. Uh, if you go to uh, some uh, homes, some Orthodox homes, uh, you will find uh, a, a sort of shrine corner or an icon corner, um, a place where uh, the family or the person uh, has uh, focused um, their uh, religious uh, devotion. So often it will be the place where they, they go to pray. Um, but it will have, there will be icons there, there will be crosses, etc., some places you go to and there, there's a cross on just about every wall uh, you, you look at. Um, most certainly if you go to, if you visit um, uh, monasteries or uh, convents and the like, um, you want, one would often expect to see that sort of thing. Uh, obviously, usually, it's the only thing you can see because they don't tend to have other forms of decoration. Um, but again, the purpose of all these things is to remind us and to make us aware um, of God's presence, to remind us, the crucifix particularly, to remind us of God's love. Um, icons of the saints, to remember those who have gone before us, who are ordinary like us, but achieved extraordinary things because they lived striving uh, for and with God. Literature, books, uh, good spiritual reading, um, oodles and oodles and oodles of, of books out there um, but there's a lot of rubbish out there as well um, 
Now, it's not because of um, a desire to police, rather like um, Soviet commissioners, that clergy will often say, um, probably check with me. Um, it's just to ensure uh, that you're not getting rubbish. Now, there used to be um, a system, um, both in the East and in the West, in, in fact, um, of indicating in a book uh, whether it had um, approval. Um, in the West, uh, this would often, you find it on the second or third page, and you'll find the words nihil obstat or imprimatur. Uh, and an imprimatur or a nihil obstat uh, was um, certification by a theologian or by a bishop uh, that the contents of the book were sound, uh, that they were okay. Uh, similarly, in Orthodox literature, um, often there will, there will be some uh, uh, sign uh, denoting that, that, that a bishop or an acknowledged theologian has recognised the contents of the book and said it's okay. Um, and this is particularly important these days, I think, more than ever, because there is so much rubbish um, around. Um, And one will get, after a while, to know and to recognise, as it were, um, uh, sound authors. Um, but, you know, if, if, uh, if, you're, if you're ever unsure, then, then just ask. Uh, by all means, just ask, and I will give you an honest uh, appraisal uh, of, uh, of, of, of an author or, or whatever. But again, here, of course, what we want to be certain of, what we, want, what we want to be sure of, is that we are receiving good advice. And which is why, generally speaking, um, uh, as a rule of thumb, it is better uh, to uh, buy and read uh, those books by um, acknowledged and recognised authors um, who are, we know are orthodox, uh, we know are, uh, are, are sound Catholics, um, in order to receive um, uh, reliable uh, information. And that's the beauty, of course, of tradition, is that we have 2,000 years' worth of collected works, 2,000 years' worth of collected wisdom and knowledge. Um, but, as you know, uh, or will appreciate from our um, previous conferences on heresies, it is still possible for people to get things seriously wrong. Um, so it is as well uh, often to, to check. And that's the same uh, for theological books or catechetical books as for devotional books. We often want to be careful uh, we, we, with, with devotional material. Now on Saturday, um, I promised to uh, uh, to introduce uh, some of the spiritual exercises by uh, St Ignatius of Loyola, by uh, St Teresa of Avila, St Teresa of Lisieux, and others. But these will come with, um, uh, as it were, um, health warnings or spiritual health warnings, um, because there is much uh, in what they say which is good, uh, and there's much uh, and there's other in what they say which is not helpful um, and which is why it's always best generally to have um, a spiritual director uh, in discerning vocation because um, there are things to, to watch out for. In part this comes around because um, often the, the saint uh, is sharing their own process of vocational discernment and so it's not always necessarily relevant to anybody else. Um, so we find with St. Teresa of, of, of Avila, for example, uh, she has these ecstatic visions, uh, etc. Um, great for her, brilliant for her, um, but not necessarily um, uh, relevant to anybody else. So um, that's why you know, it's, it's good to check. Um, but more of that on Saturday. Um, but then there are um, recognised um, 
books of long authorship uh, in the tradition of the church, uh, which are always um, sound and solid uh, and good to read. Uh, things like, for example, the, uh, uh, the Rule by St. Benedict, his Rule for Monks. Um, whilst on the one hand, it deals with the practicalities of um, ordering life uh, within a monastery, at the same time, uh, it speaks to and exemplifies uh, the principles involved of basically sacralizing uh, the Christian life. Uh, as we said the other day, though we're not all necessarily called uh, to be monks and nuns, we are nonetheless all of us called uh, to holiness. Uh, and as I said, I think it was on, on Monday again, um, you know, we have this tendency to sort of divorce and separate um, our everyday existence from, say, the everyday existence of monks and nuns, so that we think that what goes on in convents and monasteries is all holy um, and, you know, vastly different to what uh, occurs in our own lives, but which, of course, is, is nonsense. The only difference is that the monks and the nuns are deliberately sacralising their everyday existence. But they still go to the loo, they still got to go shopping for food, they still got to cook, they still got to clean, they still got to do all the mundane, ordinary things that, you know, busy our lives. The difference is, is the intentions they have as they do them, is the prayers they are making while they do them, um, is the glory they're seeking to give God through them, by them. And those sort of principles we can adapt and we can use um, ourselves. I'll leave that there, I think. So that's those are some of the ways in which, um, from tradition, um, uh, Christians have uh, developed tools uh, and techniques able to sacralise their lives and to realise their lives uh, as, uh, as exiled citizens of heaven. The key, the key all the time is and this is where Our Lady really does show the way. The key is to try and live always in holy fear, which, remember, is not to live perpetually frightened of God, but to live always conscious of him. As we said at the beginning, because he is everywhere, he is always around. But it is us, not him, who create the epistemic distance that prevents us or obfuscates um, are um, knowing uh, all the time that he is around us. And yet we see in the lives of the saints, particularly those who have deliberately sought um, to manifest in their lives that closeness with God. So we see it, for example, in the lives of, of particular hermits and anchorites, of course. Um, but we see it too in the, in the lives of um, uh, people like St. Francis of, of Rome, or indeed of St. Monica, mother of St. Augustine. Um, we see how it is possible um, to sacralize the everyday. You know, as I said at the beginning, we have this tendency um, to almost sort of divorce saints from the reality of existence, and yet they only became saints because they dealt with the everyday and they yet became holy, uh, and they sanctified their everyday we can do likewise. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen.